Welcome to the second day of the Punishment in Global Peripheries workshop. I'm Samuel Singler. I'm a PhD candidate in criminology uh, at the Center for Criminology here in Oxford, and I'll be chairing the session today. So just taking care of logistics and hopefully pointing out when it's whose turn to speak. I won't be taking up much time today with a lengthy introduction, but let me just quickly go over the logistics of the session. So in this session, we're going to discuss two highly interesting papers. One of the planned speakers, unfortunately, had to drop out of the session, but we do still have two presentations left. This might mean that we might break up a bit early for the coffee break, but also we can just see if we have a good discussion going and we've got time until the scheduled 1140, I think, in any case. So each presentation will last around 20 minutes and the presentations will be followed by around 10 minutes of comments by our discussant today, who is Professor Mary Bosworth of Oxford University. After Mary has finished her comments, we'll then open up for a general Q&A with the audience. And at that point, you can indicate if you have a question in the Zoom chat or by raising your hand on Zoom, and then I'll get to you as soon as possible. And obviously, if you already think of a question during the presentations, then feel free to indicate that in the chat and then I'll get back to you um, once the Q&A begins. But just to be clear, we'll take all the questions once we have comments um, from Mary first. And the session will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube, but the Q&A will not be included in the recording in case any of the audience members are wondering about that. So without further ado, in order not to take up too much time, let's just move on to the first presentation of the day by Julia Fabini from the University of Bologna and Valeria Ferraris from the University of Turin. So Julia and Valeria, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, just allow me to share my screen. And start the presentation. Just, okay. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. We are glad to be here in this uh, context and to be able to share our ideas with you. So this is a work in progress and uh, we welcome any feedbacks you might have. Also, it is quite, quite fair to say that uh, uh, we come to this debate moving from studies of immigration control, that is to say that we are not punishment scholars. Uh, but we are sure that this is the best uh, context for presenting our ideas and we are happy to have the possibility to enter this dialogue. So what we are going to pre present today is a joint reflection that uh, Valeria and I have been uh, elaborating lately. We would like to thank Luis and uh, Maximo for, uh, because they invited us to think through the Italian case as a periphery of uh, Europe and stimulated us to detect differences and peculiarities of the Italian way of border management compared to Europe. So uh, our paper takes inspiration from the story of Musa Balde, who is a 23 years old guy from Guinea, who uh, one month ago committed suicide in uh, the Prevere Mobile Detention Center in uh, Turin in uh, Northern Italy. He was detained in the center after being victim of a violent uh, xenophobic aggression by three Italian guys. And uh, he was in, in isolation for a reason and still injured both physically and uh, psychologically when he decided to kill himself. So our paper questioned the nature and the transformation of punishment when it comes to migration control. And it does so investigating migration and punishment in Italy. Um, so let me just provide you with an overview of the structure of the presentation today. First, we explain what sense we consider Italy as a periphery. Then we will identify the different sites where immigration penalty occur in uh, Italy. So prison, immigration detention, immigration crimes, uh, deportation and pushback. We will use the limited data available, and uh, this is an issue per se uh, regarding the transparency of uh, control. 
and but we will use the limited data to analyze the numbers of migrants going through these uh, uh, different uh, sites of the immigration penalty. And uh, our final aim is to investigate how and where migrants are punished and to finally infer the reason behind such punishment. So what is being punished and uh, should we be talking about punishment at all? And uh, uh, let me just say that in this paper, we are uh, dedicating much time to the discussion of uh, data and less to the theoretical framework. It suffice to say that we build on a challenging article of uh, 2018 by Mary Boswell, uh, Katia Franco and Sharon Pickering. We invited uh, uh, to reconceptualize what should be considered as punishment in light of novel developments in the mechanism of border control. They call for the necessity to innovate the field of punishment and society by, by focusing not only on prison as punishment and not only on a national focus. They contend that it is important to broaden the scope of what we look as punishment in order to catch and try explaining the changes uh, taking place in the punitive field. Since then, many developments uh, uh, occur in the field and many of the scholars present here uh, contributed to that debate. Yesterday, for example, Branda presented on the importance of the immigration control to explain the apparent moderation in punitiveness experienced by many states uh, in uh, Europe and in the US. Um, spoiler, moderation in punitiveness is not happening in Italy. Um, so for us uh, also looking at punishment, uh, at prison, sorry, as punishment is uh, reductive in the case of migrants. Uh, so we find it rather fruitful to talk about immigration uh, penalty, which is a concept proposed by Anna Pratt in a, in a, in a book by in uh, 2005. According to Pratt, detention and deportation are the pivots of border control, key technology in the process of making citizens and governing population. So let's have a look to immigration penalty in Italy. Um, and uh, in our view, as I told you, Italy is a periphery. On the one hand, we take Italy as a case study to question the very concept of punishment when it comes to migration control. The study of the individual case that we were talking about yesterday, which has a values per se, as a production of knowledge on a specific case. On the other hand, we consider Italy as a case study that is helpful to build knowledge on a context that is not only a periphery due to a ge geography, but which is peripheral compared to the dominant narrative on how immigration finality occurs. In fact, in our view, Italy is a periphery for some peculiarities of the general legal system and of migration control. First, the classic punishment still plays an important role in migration control. Second, informal detention practices at the border and informal detention practices connected to asylum system has overrun pre-removal detention. Third, Italy is not a deportation machine, neither in terms of pushback nor deportations. And four, in general, the degree of uncertainty in the legal system, uh, not just immigration matters, is paramount compared to other European countries. So starting for, from prison, we want to underline some specificities of the Italian case compared to other European countries. And uh, here I pass to Valeria. Thank you, Giulia. <coughs> um, <coughs> if we, we look uh, at uh, the graph on the prison population trend that this shows, here we can easily see that the tension rate in Italy um, decrease and increase uh, in connection with what we could call domestic issue, domestic event. Uh, the pardon law back in 2007, uh, in 2013, the action taken in order to respond to the European Court of Human Rights judgment 
on prison overcrowding, but overall, compared to the other EU countries, Italy uh, does not experience a decrease in uh, detention rate. As you can easily see uh, from 2015 to 2019, uh, the detention rate uh, has grown and of course, in then we have experienced the decrease due to um, COVID, but is uh, almost the only EU country where we have uh, an increase from 2016. Quite the opposite, uh, if we look at the crime rate in Italy as um, in other countries, the crime rate uh, dropped. Um, if we move to what is the topic of our uh, discussion and see the percentage of non-national citizen in prison, as most of you probably know, um, the percentage is stable since years and we can say that is not going to decrease and is about 32 and 34 percent of uh, inmates. And if we also look at the flows, we can see that the percentage is even higher. Um, recently, um, in around uh, about 40, 45 percent of the people that annually enter in, in prison from uh, freedom and the over -rep representation of the national citizens in Italian prison is a stable feature of uh, Italian prison uh, system. And here I pass to Julia. Okay, and uh, so when we look at immigration penalty, we cannot avoid considering also immigration detention. The most known and oldest form of immigration detention in Italy is pre-removal detention in uh, CPRs, in CPR, uh, which are Centri di Permanenza per il Rimpatrio. They were established in uh, 1998 uh, and they have changed names and duration uh, of the maximum period of detention several times. It reached uh, the maximum of uh, 18 months and now it is set at uh, three months. Uh, even with some differences depending on the categories of uh, migrants detained. Uh, well, but as, as it can see, uh, as you can see in this table, the number of people detained remained rather low, even if uh, even at this peak in uh, 2000 in 2002, uh, and it is low, especially if confronted with the number of illegalized migrants that are estimated to be present in Italy, about 500,000, and with the measure of immigration detention in other countries in, uh, in Europe. Um, sorry. <laughs> oh. um, so, sorry. Uh, moreover, an average of no more than 50% of migrants are removed uh, yearly after removal detention. So this means that migrants are intercepted, detained, and ev eventually not deported. They are released in the territory with an order to leave uh, the country in seven days, which is the most common way in Italy for executing deportation. And this question the functions of immigration detention. Well, but detention in CPRs is not the only uh, immigration, the unique typologies of immigration detention that we have in Italy. It also exists in immigration detention at the entry, so at the external border, and especially in the hotspot. Uh, they were created in 2016 uh, to, let's say, to manage the arrivals by sea um, at, uh, as a consequence of the refugees crisis. There are four of spots in, uh, in Italy, in the southern Italy, and uh, in this facility migrants who just landed on Italian shore undergo medical screening, pre-identification procedures, aerodac registration, photo and fingerprinting. Um, the operations are carried out jointly by the Italian police, Frontex, EASO and uh, Europol. Here you can see the number of migrants detained in the hotspot compared to the uh, 
sorry, compared to the number of migrants uh, arriving by, by sea. And the number of migrants between hotspots in 2016, 2020 are striking. They really uh, are way uh, bigger numbers than uh, the migrants detained in the CPRs, as this graph shows. So if nowadays the number of people detained in centers are fewer than those entering the prison yearly, an additional reflection is needed for the numbers of people detained at the entry, not at the exit uh, in the case of Italy. Also, and this is my last point with regard to immigration detention, uh, one should consider also the number of migrants, asylum seekers mainly, that are detained in uh, facilities uh, that we call of uh, de facto immigration detention, um, that uh, I really do not, do not have time to go through uh, now, but uh, we are for sure open to answer any question you might have in the QI section. And uh, here I pass again to Valeria. To conclude the exam of what occurs at the border, we need to spend one word on deportation and pushbacks. Because uh, if the numbers of people in detention center, or let's call it similar detention facilities, is high, uh, on the other end, the deportation rate is incredibly low, uh, especially if we consider the number of illegalized uh, people in Italy. And also, if we look at pushback, also in terms of pushback, um, the numbers are uh, low and in particular they seem completely unrelated to the pressure at the border, but they are connected I can say only with the effectiveness of the political agreement reached with the countries on the other side of the Mediterranean, in particular, lately Tunisia, Libya, and before Albania. <laughs> if we conclude this part on the analysis of um, what happened in the border area and we move to the uh, domestic territory. Uh, looking at immigration offences. When we talk about immigration offences, it probably is, I'm not sure that is something familiar for all the people all over um, different regions uh, in the world. We refer to the use of uh, criminal law to reinforce administrative rules aimed at controlling immigration flows. In Italy, um, the Italian legal framework um, used this crime since uh, the, the, the first immigration law, but across the years they have constantly expanded, so new crimes, new hypotheses. Um, they punish uh, the people who do not respect the rule on entry and stay in Italy, and in addition, uh, a wide range of smuggling conducts. And also, immigration law uh, has uh, quite, um, um, quite creative uh, crimes uh, introduced uh, that can be committed only by foreigners, such as the forgery of documents, the alteration of false declaration about their own identity, the alteration of fingerprints, that actually punish conduct that are already punished by other crimes, but in this case the, um, the penalty is much higher. So we have a quite um, big uh, group of uh, crimes, but compared to other countries, and probably UK is the most known uh, case, these offenses are actually enforced. If we look at this table that show the number of non-national citizens under investigation, we can see that in the, the family of immigration crime is quite significant. But if we move to the next table that show the conviction, um, immigration crime represent the second group of crimes for which non-national are uh, convicted. 
um, probably you are wondering and um, why immigration offenses are relevant in a discussion about punishment. Um, we believe that they are relevant first because they represent a good example of the use of criminal law as a tool to govern. Then it's highly symbolic and an example of the populist ideology of immigration control. But finally, it also shows the arbitrariness of the Italian system, where it is very difficult to speak about one country and uh, one uh, system, because each police headquarter has its own policy on if and how enforce immigration offenses. To give you an example, in my city, Turin, I do not see an, a non-national charge for illegal stay uh, since uh, years, but in Alessandria, which is a city 60 kilometers from here, is a daily practice of my friends uh, who work as lawyers. To sum up, uh, we have tried to uh, present why Italy, we believe, is a periphery, but also, and also, an intriguing case to study. And we have tried to summarize here the main reason. Uh, prison population do not decrease as in most of the EU country, and the overrepresentation of non national is a stable and permanent feature. The physical control of people at the border by detention and civil detention facilities plays a central role. Uh, and this condition of civil de detention is prolonged uh, quite uh, after. Uh, quite far from the border in the first reception uh, facilities. We also see a limited use of pre-removal immigration detention as a tool to enforce deportation, and this um, reduce enforcement of deportation questions on the real fun function of administrative detention. And in addition, this extensive use of criminal law to reinforce administrative rules and creating new crimes uh, complete a picture that is a picture of overcriminalization of non-national uh, uh, citizens. Therefore, to conclude, in our view, the control of migrants in Italy represents a good example of a composition of practices that can be described as punishment practices of mobility control at the southern border of Europe, and also practice of imprisonment as a tool to control in the domestic sphere, also and certainly connected with populist uh, ideology in using uh, crime control. The question, however, in our view, is not only if immigration penalty is punishment, punishment and our answer is yes, it is. <laughs> but also what immigration penalty tells us about punishment in the contemporary Italy. And uh, we believe that it sheds light on, in the, on the continuum of immigration detention and imprisonment. Uh, punishment evolves and adapt to the new subject to be punished. And on, uh, in the same, um, and in the meanwhile, immigration detention and immigration crimes symbolic and materially produce the subjects who will be imprisonment. And uh, second point, it also um, shows some continuities and some innovation in punishment. Um, innovation, I mean, if it's not exactly new, in the subject punish that are um, increasingly more and as a stable presence in our uh, crime and immigration control um, system non-national continuity in the subject because they are still poor and marginal, continuities in the rationale of punishment. The prison uh, is a social dump and uh, currently in Italy is probably one of the worst situation compared to, to the past. I mean, the living conditions are getting worse and the full picture is uh, quite uh, worse and is a social dump of non-national. Thank you to, for the attention, and we are open to question after all the, after the other presentation. Thank you so much, Julia and Valeria, for that very interesting presentation. I'm, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions later in the Q and A, um, but before that, let me hand it over to Matteo Mabilia from the University of Bologna. Thank you. I start sharing my 
presentation. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank all the people who organized this conference, Luis and Maximo, but also the people working behind the scene and also all the other participants for their presentations. It's a honor to be here today. I'm very excited because it's uh, the first time I present a part of my dissertation to such a prestigious audience and to so many experts in the field of criminology. So, I would like to expose and introduce my research in border criminology in the Global South. The context I studied is the one of uh, Syrian forced immigration to Jordan, and it regards processes of uh, criminalization, punishment, and uh, law enforcement in the humanitarian control and inclusion of refugees. In particular, I studied the uh, in particular, I studied uh, the management of the refugee flow and its inclusion in Jordan. Firstly, looking at uh, the control of the external border, so how Jordan let and allow migrants to enter into the country. And secondly, uh, regarding uh, the border within uh, the Jordanian territory, um, and that are, for example, uh, the one of refugee camps, which became crucial places for managing refugee inclusion because of their connection to the national labor market. So connection between the border and economic exploitation of the refugees, how economic relation and border management interact together is what I look at through border criminolog criminological lens. Here we have a first map of uh, Jordan and Syria and the, the neighboring countries. And you can see that uh, they are next uh, each other. And they have, um, um, they share a border of uh, almost uh, uh, 300 kilometers. Sorry. Cannot, ah, okay. Um, so, as Syrian refugees uh, have arrived in Jordan since the beginning of the Syrian war, they have experienced the, the border governmentality of Jordan, where uh, the case of implementation of neoliberal policies have shaped the immigration policies and now also the humanitarian practices. The general framework I used is the one of uh, border criminology. Uh, which shed light on, on the crime and the punishment related to mobility, but also to its control. This paper aims to bring uh, new items to the concept, uh, to the border criminological debate, because of the attention to a global South phenomenon, in which humanitarian practices are intertwined with uh, neoliberal policies. The management of, the, of migration to the global north is uh, studied much more because it concerns us as Western society in the foreground. However, displacement and forced migration continue to occur mainly in the global south. So another question is why only a tiny percentage of academic literature concern control of mobility currently ongoing in the global south? This research, this research certainly does not aim to bridge the gap, but I think this conference in some way is a first step. Syrian refugee migration has been one of the most addressed by the, the Western media because of its arrival to border of Europe with the so-called refugee crisis in 2015. However, criminological studies have not focused on the practices and the logic of management of this flow of people in the neighboring country, uh, such as Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan, which received the greatest number of refugees. In the paper, I underline the peculiarities of uh, the reception of at least uh, one million of Syrians in Jordan 
which has a population of just uh, 9 million inhabitants. Forced Syrian migration has involved uh, the activation of different uh, humanitarian actors and the creation of different humanitarian spaces, such as refugee camps. And uh, this uh, encampment policies uh, was an approach undertaken by Jordan to govern refugee population. Furthermore, uh, the encampment policy was also taken, undertaken uh, in order to enhance the visibility of the humanitarian situation in the, uh, to the international community. And Jordan is also a country characterized for having implemented neoliberal economic policies throughout the uh, last decades. Indeed, the odorizing and criminalizing rhetoric, which is typical of neoliberal immigration policies of global north countries, should be expected. However, the relations within the hosted community and the hosting society are more complex because of the humanitarian approach combined with a shared Arab identity that unites Syrians and Jordanians. Then Jordan is not among the, the signatory countries of the 1951 Refugee Convention. And uh, although, uh, although uh, it has signed a memorandum of, un of understanding with uh, UNHCR in uh, 1998, Jordan has avoided official recognition of refugees under its uh, national law and prefers to refer to Syrians as visitors or uh, Arab brothers or uh, simply guests. And this caused uh, an overlap with the uh, immigratory law, which creates a situation of vulnerability and um, illegality, since refugees could be simultaneously members of the, of the workforce. Here I have some uh, pieces of, uh, of interviews, but I can uh, come back later to this. Here we have a second map uh, of the Syrian-Jordanian border and the main transit points for refugees. In particular, um, there are the two biggest uh, refugee camps of Jordan, which are the Zatari and the Azraq. Zatari is next uh, to the border with Syria and it's near to, to Mafraq, uh, a big city where I, I've done a lot of interviews. Whereas, uh, but Azraq camp, uh, as you can see, is mainly an isolated camp in the desert. Then regarding the... Um, the methodology. Uh, this research was uh, is based on an interdisciplinary approach with the combination of uh, original empirical material in the form of uh, 24 uh, semi-structure interviews that uh, I carried out uh, in uh, a three month fieldwork in the north of Jordan, in Mafraq and Irbid. Then if you want uh, I think I would skip this part uh, in, uh, of the detail of methodology, but if you want to know more about it, I'm, I'm open to discuss it in the QA session. Um, so the differential inclusion of Syrians uh, within Jordanian territory and society starts from the external border. Uh, their first practices of control became evident. Um, already at this stage, the border revealed also to be not only a static entity, but was used as a technology of control and selection of the population, both in the timing and in the space of crossing it. Then, thanks to the humanitarian government, uh, Syrians were brought to refugee camps in order to be controlled and documented. There they received uh, an asylum seeker certificate documents uh, issued by UNHCR, which is valid for a stay of uh, 12 months and it is renewable, but it is not valid for work or for uh, full residence. 
Um, then in order to allow uh, Syrians to leave uh, the refugee camp, the bailout uh, system has been set and used, uh, and used from the beginning. It was uh, established in order to control Syrian movements within the national territory, but it was also a filter of uh, economic status, since uh, only people with connection uh, in, the, in the Jordanian community or people who could afford the, the, the payment of the exit could legally move into uh, the national territory. So the system, uh, the bailout system, implicates uh, the reliance on smugglers to get out from the camp and uh, also to, um, and this produced uh, a situation of uh, subordination of refugees. Then uh, vulnerability has been created through uh, the criminalization of the Syrian workforce in certain labor sector in order to protect the, the Jordanian workforce. Syrians could legally work uh, just in agriculture, construction and other low-skilled jobs. But for me now it's important to underline that um, obtaining a work permit was uh, um, really was really difficult and that the and also that uh, the um, the Jordanian national economy is generally based on informality so uh, the Jordanian labor and immigration laws have facilitated uh, refugee exploitation and inc and uh, inclusion in the informal economy uh, secondly vulnerability was established through the the um, I call not so strong enforcement of uh, internal border control. Jordanian government government draft uh, uh, strict policies for uh, foreign uh, workers that lack of enforcement, at least for Syrians. According to my interviews, a large number of Syrians work uh, informally without uh, a permit. And uh, refugees were found out of camps by the Jordanian police uh, without the, the proper bailout documents or without uh, the proper work uh, permit are not sent to detention facilities, but they are returned back to, to refugee camps. So the camp takes uh, a detention connotation given also the difficulty to uh, to get out from it. It also assumed um, a punitive function uh, for those who leave it uh, illegally and thus uh, deportation uh, to the camps became a tool to discipline those who work without permit. Moreover, uh, refugee camps can also be seen as a, go a governmental tool used to exclude certain socioeconomic classes of uh, refugees. Um, so deportation can happen, as you uh, can read from the, the interviews, uh, randomly. They happen randomly because police control are not carried out regularly and they produce a situation of vulnerability and fear among Syrian workers. And to sum up, I can say that the uh, Jordanian economy has benefited from this neoliberal logic of um, keeping refugees as uh, the vulnerable workforce. To sum up, uh, Jordan is a country in the global south characterized by having a neoliberal, neoliberal economic structure and by lacking a proper le refugee legal system. And in all of these contexts, uh, the humanitarian logic and practices are added in the discussion since the government, the Jordanian government, uh, takes advantage of the refugee presence through the encampment, but also through the non-encampment policies. Or better, we can say that the humanitarian devices, uh, the, way, the way to manage camps and refugees, are located within the logic of uh, neoliberal framework policies that govern the Jordanian national market, informal jobs and exploitation of refugees.
but also uh, it concerned the immobilization of refugees in the global south. And thank you for the, atten for the attention. Thank you so much, Matteo, for that presentation to which we will again return in the Q&A. And at this point, let me just remind the audience members um, that everyone will have a chance to ask some questions either by raising their hand, but also if you already know you have a question, then feel free to indicate that in the chat and I can get back to you as soon as we get to the Q&A. Before we do that, however, we now will hear some comments from Professor Mary Bosworth. Thanks, Samuel, and uh, thanks everybody, especially the two or the three speakers. It was uh, both papers were very interesting, um, and I I don't have to say I'm not sure I've been a discussant before, so I'm not 100% sure what purpose a discussant has in a, in uh, in general terms. But what I thought I would do is just give a little bit of um, reaction to the papers individually, and then raise um, some more general issues which I think both of the papers have made me think about and probably they're issues which I'm already thinking about in terms of my own work as well. Um, so I really I really liked uh, Julia and Valeria how your paper sort of maps out all of the or, or many of the different parts of the system and I think that that work is still really vitally important to be doing um, across a range of countries and so trying to to connect these different uh, institutions um, and also different practices uh, the only one that I guess seemed to be not included in your in your paper and I was wondering a bit why uh, was the police um, so you know criminal law prisons detention deportation um, so you know, I, I invite you to talk a little bit about the role of the police um, in Italy in this in this field. Um, I I also thought um, it was really helpful to show so clearly how detention seems the numbers in detention seem to correspond to quite local domestic issues and um, and you know changes in law or political events um, and that likewise the 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 sort of lack of connection between the numbers in detention um, in the hotspots and the arrivals if I understood that right and the and the relationship between the numbers in the hotspots and the detention centers so I think this work about trying to show all of the different places and spaces that the state is is putting foreign nationals, I think is really important. I suppose, and this is what I'm gonna get into it at the end of all this, is I suppose I wonder, I, I go backwards and forwards in my own work about how important it is for us to, to make the argument that these are all forms of punishment. And Vanessa Barker, who I know is on the call, and I've talked about this at length. And sometimes I do wonder whether that, it, that desire that we have is actually stifling our um, intellectual imaginations a little bit and so so I'll talk about that more in, in more detail. Um, I also have to say I wasn't I didn't quite understand um, the argument about considering Italy as as a periphery I wasn't I wasn't completely sure what what thinking of it in those terms did in and and if it was that it was unusual in, 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 in Europe, um, for instance, also in terms of its wider legal system. So, so I thought the point you made about the general uncertainty of, of um, the criminal system in, in Italy is, is also really important. Um, I suppose I wondered a tiny bit whether some of the critiques that Lara made yesterday about viewing Russia always as an exception might, could be leveled at, at, at the utility of thinking of Italy um, as a periphery um, and whether in a way it lets, does it let it off the hook or does it kind of make it, make it seem too specific to not have sort of wider, wider um, relevance. But, but I may have, I may have misunderstood the, the, the reason for thinking of it and for casting it as a periphery. Um, I have lots of other uh, comments that I've been writing down, but but I guess I'll move to Matteo. Um, Matteo, I really I really appreciated um, the 
the fact that you have gone outside of <laughs> the metropole that you've actually done uh, border criminological research um, in the global south and I think that that is as this whole event is showing that is that is something which uh, we we obviously need a lot more of um, and I think it's you know it continues this this important work of trying to um, document um, and understand where people are being held and how people are being held and what what their experience um, is of that and I know in the in the longer paper which I read yesterday you um, you spend quite a lot of time also talking about the border itself and so not just the camps but the border itself um, and I liked very much the the connections that you made between these uh, the practice border control the practice of and the labor market and I think all of that is is um, is very important. I suppose, um, you know, I had, I, I guess I had one question, one, one perhaps slightly critical question around taking, about some of the effects of taking a criminological approach to looking at refugee camps, for example, would, would be that we would of course see them as coercive and punitive spaces because we're criminologists. And so is there any danger in overlooking, um, or, or perhaps not giving quite enough of an account of some of the other um, rationales for those places, some of which are about protection and, you know, uh, sort of safeguarding and, and those sorts of things. And so how can we, how can we keep, keep the, the multiple roles of these places in view? And, and that multiplicity, I think, is, is what, um, is at stake in both of these papers. So it seems to me that that, that criminologists and, and, and other people interested in border control are doing a lot of really important work at uncovering the sort of contradictory nature of a lot of practices which are being um, done in the name of border control. And and we and there's a lot of you know there's a lot of evidence, particularly in the, in both of these papers as well, about the disconnection between, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, rates of deportation, for example, and these sorts of practices. So that although a lot of them are justified in terms of deportation, that actually deportation seems to sort of move up and down a little bit um, independently of these of these practices. Um, and I think that works really important. I think that when we that, that one of the things motivating that work has been what uh what you were both talking about to sort of show how punishment is is much broader than we think it is here look at all these other practices which we could we could use to expand our understanding of punishment and i think i think that's important and i myself do it but i suppose i'm also wondering sometimes as i said before whether certain things are lost and so just you know, in general, is there a danger if we are trying to, uh, if, if punishment is our reference all the time, is there a danger that we actually reproduce some of the very problems in the wider field of punishment that lie behind this conference, for instance? So, Matteo, you know, your paper is, is quite unusual in, regard, in terms of where you went to do your research. So if you go to lots of, lots of criminology events around, um, around punishment and border control, there won't be very many papers that have gone anywhere other than the US, Australia, and the UK. So, so, so you know, is it punishment that is kind of locking us into the geographical um, narrowness or, or is it criminology that's locking us into it? Um, and I suppose, um, I wonder, you know, whether we, could also think about methodological you know are we are we bringing over methodological kind of um blind spots as well um and so so you know are there are there empirical and conceptual effects of of trying to to sort of expand the field of punishment as part of that i wonder sometimes whether um you know are, do we do a disservice to the complexity of punishment in just the criminal justice arena. So, I mean, one of the things that, 
that it seems to me that that border criminologists have done a lot of really good work on is showing these massive inconsistencies, you know, the, the sort of dislocation between deportation and, and detention. But there's always a sort of slight implication that punishment in the criminal justice system is, is more rational, is more well thought out, is more justified, is, is, you know, can be understood using liberal ideas of legitimacy. And I, I guess I, I don't really think that it, that it can be. And I, I suspect that if, if people who were interested just in criminal justice punishment did some of the same sorts of work as border criminologists are doing, they might find all sorts of in, uh, inconsistencies. And they would also find all of these other um, institutions which are not part of the criminal justice system. So if you just think, for instance, about school to prison pipeline kind of work in the US, you know, there's, you know, use of mental hospitals, whatever, there's all these, there's all of these other bits of state and non-state uh powers forms of state and non-state powers which are operational and, and relevant to criminal punishment as well but haven't really necessarily been folded into the the more standard family accounts of punishment um in terms of the the sort of effect for for those of us who are interested in border control of wanting to um of prioritizing the punitive nature of them. I, I, I wonder sometimes whether, um, whether there might be other ways in which we could, other, I guess, concepts that we could be trying to spend more time thinking about. So, so for many years, and Lara might remember this, I gave a talk years ago in, in uh, Scotland on administrative power. And I was like, what we need to do is stop thinking about punishment, start thinking about administrative uh, power. And, you know, I still have that uh, talk and I've never actually had time to to really do that but I still think that I still think that that one of the things that's really important about all of these practices is precisely that they're not in the criminal justice system and that they're motivated um, in in legal terms and in um, in kind of procedural terms by a different set of logic and I feel like we, we, we need to kind of figure out more about that. And I think, I think here you do see some of the really uh, interesting work in the field on humanitarianism that, 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 that I guess, Matteo, your, your work really would connect with as, as offering sort of ways forward. Um, I think that um, the, other, the other sorts of alternative frames which have actually been included in both of these papers would be to spend a lot more time um, thinking about politics and political theory but also like popular politics so so i thought you know the the the, the paper by um julia and, and valeria which talked about you know the relevance of actual like internal italian concerns that i mean that that's really important and we see this in the uk at the moment that there's been a sort of fairly successful attempt to whip up you know anxiety around this very small number of people coming over from northern france on boats and that's going to legitimate a whole series of other of other kinds of um, practices. Now we can put that all into popular punitiveness and and just stick with that model. But maybe it would it would be good for us to really try and understand a bit more about the politics of immigration control as something around xenophobia or as you know as things around what it means to be a citizen or a community or whatever. Maybe maybe we could do more work there. And equally in the international sphere. So I mean, Matteo, you talked in your paper about um the importance for jordan of you know on the international level of being seen to be a country that was receiving um receiving uh refugees so I, I sort of feel like you know we could do more to try and understand um what's happening in those terms um equally obviously none of you talked about race um and that was you know alpha was going to be the person who spoke about race um which is a problem for all of us that we you know we do this we have one person who who represents the issue and 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 it's still not integrated um but you know i think again a lot more work needs to be done on those topics and that is not something which field of punishment studies has done enough on in its own right um, and so is that, a, is that a weakness we're bringing over with us? And so, you know, to take the Italian example, wouldn't it be interesting to try and understand, you know, the, the different rationales for Albanians versus, you know, Nigerians 
and how or whether they do end up in the same outcome. So, you know, is race important? Is Italy's sort of geopolitical role uh, relevant to, to these contemporary uh, practices or, or not? Um, anyway, uh, I, I guess I, I will avoid sort of going on and on and on, but I suppose what I think that the, both of the papers show is that there are multiple and competing factors at play. Um, and there are obviously very important pathways and connections with criminal justice and with punishment. But I think we should leave more space for trying to, to widen our conceptual language and vocabulary so that we are not, so that we don't get kind of trapped in some of the, some of the, the, the familiar limitations of thinking about punishment. Because I, I don't think it's only, I don't think that's, you know, that that gets us where we want to be. And I guess maybe that is my final point, which is, that's the question I think we need to ask. What do we, what do we gain from thinking about border control in terms of punishment? What's the purpose of that? Is that because we want to have an academic discussion about punishment or is it because we're kind of pushing towards, you know, abolition and different forms of practice? And in, in my experience with um, government officials and with private sector actors, this argument has no traction because they simply say, oh, it's not punishment. So, so it's that, it's that kind of complication, because this is absolutely a field in criminology, which is very closely tied. And I know, Julia, your work is personally, you know, very closely tied to activism, very closely tied to, to trying to bring about change. And um, does, does thinking of it in terms of punishment actually get us there? I'm, I'm not, 100% sure it does. But anyway, that's it for me.